I'm here today with Daniel Bowman Jr. Dan is an author, poet, and associate professor of English at Taylor University in Upland, Indiana, where he co-directs the Making Literature Conference. Dan is the author of a new book entitled On the Spectrum, Autism, Faith, and the Gifts of Neurodiversity. He writes and speaks regularly on neurodiversity, including the SBC's Facts and Trends website, the MIE, Ruminate, and at the Association of Writers and Writing Programs. Dan is editor-in-chief of Relief, a journal of art and faith. He engages in several in-person and online communities addressing neurodiversity and mental health and mentors young people on the spectrum. Dan, it's so wonderful to have you here with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. I'm really excited to chat with you. Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, I mean, I was so excited when I saw about this book and, you know, I've begun reading it and, um, mm. you know, not that I'm necessarily well read on this subject, but one of the things I just loved about it was that, you know, it comes from the, the eyes and ears and voice of someone who's experienced this as opposed to someone else writing about it. Right. I think, uh, yeah, that, you know, I've been talking about this a lot lately with folks uh, over the last couple of years, there was this hashtag on Twitter um, called own voices. And it was begun by um, actually an, a Dutch autistic writer who's a young adult novelist um, named Corinne Davis. And she felt like it was necessary at the time, a couple of years back now to, to begin this hashtag and this kind of movement because um, Many books that featured an autistic character, whether it was fiction um, or a memoir, um, were written by neurotypical people. And so a lot of times you'd get a parent of an autistic child writing a memoir about autism um, and often, frankly, centering their own pain and suffering uh, from, from parenting a child on the spectrum. Or, you know, you'd have uh, something like uh, there was a, a young adult book in, I believe, 2010 that won the National Book Award uh, for, in the YA category uh, called Mockingbird. And again, it's a, it features an autistic character, but it's written by a neurotypical author. And so um, some of my conviction in terms of writing this book came from that idea that we really need to be heard um, in that firsthand account uh, through the sensory details and the way that we uh, move through the world because it is different from the way other people move through the world. Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. And, I, and you just what I've read of the book so far, it just helps me understand. I mean, hmm. without a, without question. Um, but before we get into the book, maybe could we talk a little bit about your background? Just share if you could um, more than what I talked about in the bio for people that aren't familiar with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I grew up in upstate New York, uh, central New York. So between um, Syracuse and Albany, right along where the New York State Thruway runs, uh, there's a place called the Mohawk River Valley, uh, very historical in, in terms of the, the American Revolution and everything. Um, I actually talk about that a little bit in the book, um, having to do with, with my ancestors and, and, and that. Um, I studied English and creative writing um, moved out here to Indiana, to the Midwest, and I just completed my 10th year at Taylor University. So I put, I've put in a decade at this institution, which feels crazy to me uh, to have been someplace for so long because all my other stops have been shorter. Uh, we live out here and uh, I'm with my wife and our two kids. It was their first day of school today. My daughter uh, started 11th grade today, uh, which is wild. And uh, our son started sixth grade. So we're really excited for them. Um, as you mentioned in the bio, uh, one thing that's been really important to me is mentoring uh, young people on the spectrum. <clears throat> so uh, two years ago, I got involved with this group that was just forming at Taylor, and now it's called SEND, uh, which stands for Students for Education on Neurodiversity. And it draws in uh, many autistic students, many with ADHD and and some with bipolar and some other um, comorbidities uh, of autism. And, um, and, and also just people who are curious and wanna learn more about good mental health and have awareness of good, good mental health strategies while they're in college, because of course there's so much pressure exerted on them. So that's been a huge blessing in my life is working with these students, uh, especially the autistic ones uh, for the last couple of years also. 
Well, I think it's wonderful that you've you know, given back so much, you know, to, of your time and your expertise and your experience, uh, you know, to help other people. That's just really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I've tried. I, uh, you know, I came to that conclusion a year or two ago as I was working on finishing this book and working with the students that um, those truisms, you know, Henry Nowen and many others talked about the wounded healer and those truisms about where your greatest wounds lie, you know, uh, has the potential to become the source of the greatest blessing that you can give to other people. And when I was younger, I, I, didn't understand that or I thought it was cliche or I took it for granted and the older I get the more I recognize the truth in that and that's actually a, a very beautiful uh, way to live and so I've been trying to live into that wonderful that that's that's a great role model for you know those coming after you so um, before we talk about the new book what kinds of things have you written previously uh, before on the spectrum uh, it's a great question because <laughs> my writing has been all over the place I'm probably a bit of a uh, publisher's and agent's nightmare because I, I resist having a kind of, um, although I think my voice is kind of consistent over different projects, I resist having a sort of simple brand uh, because I love fiction, all my trainings in poetry. Um, I'm not a PhD, I'm an MFA, uh, MFA in poetry writing. And so I pay attention to um, language at the most granular level. I mean, poets count syllables and, and think about relationships between sounds and line breaks. And, and when you're at that kind of a level, um, you, <clears throat> you have a sort of different relationship between form and content. So it's not, I'm just not, um, I'm not only trying to tell a story uh, but I'm trying to tell it in the best words. <laughs> and so, yeah, I started with poetry. I published a, a book of poems with a small press in Chicago in 2012. And uh, after that, I wrote some poems. I drafted two, two novels uh, to completion with a lot of revisions. And actually, I was, um, I had uh, gained an agent through one of the novels uh, that I was trying to sell. I had reached out to some agents to try to see if anyone was interested uh, in a young adult novel with an autistic protagonist. And um, so I gained my agent that way, but then the nonfiction project on the spectrum, this new book, uh, the opportunity came along to do this. And so the fiction's on the back burner. My dream, I suppose, would be to write more poetry and fiction, uh, even if, if this book does well. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Well, good for you. That's wonderful. I mean, to be able to be skilled in different genre like that, um, you know, is very impressive. Um, it's really fun to, to, to keep writing uh, in new ways. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So how did this book come about, the, on the new one, On the Spectrum? What, what's the story behind that? Uh, <laughs> this is a weird story, and, and it's, it seems very unlikely to me. Uh, but this is actually the, the, the real truth of how this happened. Um, I have talked with a number of folks. Um, I wrote some pieces for Ruminate magazine out in Colorado. Uh, and, and those pieces did really well on their website. And there were pieces that they were my earliest attempts at writing about being autistic, writing nonfiction about it. And so some folks had picked up on that and said, oh, it's, it's different to have a literary person, a guy who's in the arts writing um, about autism, usually you associate it with folks in engineering or math or, you know, things like the sciences, computers, cybersecurity, whatever. So some people picked up on it and liked it. And um, at one point, um, Caitlin Beatty, uh, who is a well-known writer herself and an excellent editor, she's in acquisitions for Brazos. Uh, she has a huge Twitter following and she had tweeted, um, in light of new acquisitions and new subjects that people are interested in, she had tweeted out, what is a subject that you would like to see tackled? Um, and she's speaking to sort of progressive Christians, I, I think. And, and, and also then the second part, who would you like to see try to tackle it? <laughs> and a good friend of mine who also has a large Twitter following <laughs> tweeted back at her and said, I want to hear about the relationship between autism and Christian faith. And I think Dan Bowman should be the person to write that book. Wow. And, and oddly enough, you know, I had the agent already because I had been working on the novel and we were trying to sell it, but we didn't get too far. And suddenly Caitlin reached out and said, is this something you'd want to do? It sounds good to me. Um, and it was just a 
fantastic opportunity. And so I got with my agent and we got a deal done with Brazos and that's it. <laughs> now the book is in my hands. That is just amazing. Wow. <laughs> You yeah, never keep, know the power of social media. <laughs> well, the power of networking and relationships. Yes. Right? You know, I mean, that's, that's what it really boils down to is, you know, kind of whom you know and who knows you. And you never know when yeah. something is going to end up coming of it. Um, yep. And, and Caitlin, by the way, uh, is a good friend of mine, too. I mean, she I've interviewed her several times. We've oh, been awesome. to my conferences, you know, and so um, and, and she's excellent. Uh, you know, well, that, and that's the thing. She is fantastic. And so when I saw that opportunity, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, there was a point at which, you know, every agent would say this, but my agent, of course, said, well, do you want to shop this idea around a little bit more? Do you want to see who, you know, um, <laughs> you know, you know, more advanced or whatever it was, all that kind of stuff. And, and I just said, I get to work with Caitlin Beatty no I don't want to look at anybody else right now <laughs> like that's such an honor I let's just do the book with them they make beautiful books they they have a great roster of authors um Jamie Smith and and Caitlin Curtis and um all these wonderful authors so I was like yeah let's let's go with Brazos so it was just a dream come true well good for you for jumping on it you know <laughs> and taking advantage of the opportunity when it you know kind of reveals itself <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um you know the book is is organized as you said kind of a, as a, a series of, of essays more or less you want to talk a little bit about the structure of the book oh yeah i'd love to because I, I i think that it's kind of um somewhat quirky maybe for folks who read a lot of uh especially if 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 people are reading like um christian living or uh books like that that are more sort of a linear uh, chronological approach. Um, I'm, I, I don't even know how to write nonfiction like that. <laughs> I take the collage approach and I think part of that has to do with the autistic brain wiring. Um, I have a lot of trouble seeing, uh, the forest for the trees. And so for me, I can look at all these individual details and these, sh these, uh, short narratives, these small anecdotes about my life that I want to investigate and, uh, and interrogate and try to understand what they meant to me and so forth. Uh, but I don't often see how they all come together. I just see them individually. Uh, and so uh, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. And at first I really wrestled with that. The, the first draft was bad. <laughs> uh, and th they told me as much. Uh, it, it just wasn't um, coherent. And, and so I needed to do more work on tying it together. But even now in terms of form, um, there are epistolary pieces, so there are letters that I'm writing to people. There are traditional longer essays, you know, 20 pages, uh, what you might think of as a creative nonfiction piece. There are very short little pieces that started as blogs um, uh, and, and some found pieces too, including poems and, and uh, some pieces of research and snippets from other things. I do interviews with people. I, I put in interviews that people did with me. So it's, it's kind of a lot of variety, I think. It, it really is. And, and one of the things I love the most was, the, you know, at different points, you kind of contrast <clears throat> the view of, of, of autistic people from neurotypical versus neurodiverse perspectives, which, again, I thought was incredibly valuable for myself because I hadn't heard some of those perspectives before. Yeah, I, I um I talked with someone recently who, uh, who said, uh, we were recording for a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he said, my greatest takeaway uh, was the stuff early in the book where you talk about, where you distinguish between the old pathology model of talking about autism in terms of its deficits and how weird and quirky and, and unusual and all these things that people are versus uh, taking it to um, an acceptance model or a neurodiversity model where you can just say, you know what, these things aren't necessarily bad, they're just different. They're just, it's just a different brain uh, operating system, you know, that makes us go. Yeah, and to, and to kind of dive into the different elements of that as you did, you know, I thought was very helpful, you know, in, in understanding things. And, and I love that little thing that you did about the tragedy of neurotypical, you know, people or something like that. I don't, <laughs> you know, it was, it was, that was a great uh, humor, uh, 
Peace. Yeah, we tried to flip the script a little bit and say, what if we talked about neurotypicals in the way that they do things? Yeah. We accept them because it's so common. We're accustomed to trying to read body language, understand sarcasm, and, you know, all these sorts of things. But on the surface level, if you look at them, they're, they're every bit as quirky as the way autistics communicate. Well, and, you know, also, too, you know, at the very beginning of the book, you, you had this, like, list of questions that all people will typically, you know, either be asked or, you know, ask themselves about, you know, right. whether to, to identify, you know, right, right. And, 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 you know, I started reading, uh, obviously, first thing you do is apply it to yourself. And you say, yeah. well, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit like that, too. I mean, you know, you, it just makes you wonder. I mean, right. We're all on a spectrum of some type, right? You know, on all these different complicated dimensions. Yeah. And I, I think that's true. I think autism is a, is a unique thing. Um, uh, a unique type of brain wiring. However, uh, we're, I think the, a larger point that could be taken away from that is we all are different. Some of it's based on nature, some's based on nurture, of course, and who knows how to disentangle all that stuff, but to leave room for that sort of nuance and to not try to force um, um, so much, you know, what you see in schools and, and education and stuff is just conformity, you know, so to leave room for that kind of nuance, different ways of approaching tough questions, different ways of approaching everyday communications and relationships and all that stuff without demanding conformity and thinking anything else is just weird. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, as humans, obviously, we're, we've got this unfortunate characteristic that we want to categorize everyone as us versus now. Right. <laughs> right. You know, draw a line somewhere in between. And, you know, there's been this line, right, you know, yeah. that is somewhat stark, at least, you know, right. and, well, you know, when you think about it and consider all these different elements, it's like, it makes you really realize that it's, it's all us. It's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, else. you know, the, uh, the, as far as the faith element, the Bible talks about that, you know, talking about the, the parts of the body are different, but it's not that one is better than the other. They just have different functions. And so you grow up hearing that stuff if you grew up in the church, and yet they only want to take it so far. Yeah. <laughs> they, well, there's the differences are fine as long as they're within a certain range, but uh, I got you got to think a little bit bigger than that sometimes. So, uh, for people reading the book, what would you say is like the number one thing that you'd like for them to take away? Uh, certainly, a lot of what we've just been talking about uh, just sort of normalize those differences and to normalize talking about um, the autistic brain um, in ways that move beyond the old pathologies and move into an acceptance model. Um, aside from that, I think um, I, I'm, I'm very, very interested in storytelling as a form of knowing. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, I, I mean, scientifically, we, we understand, and there have been study after study after study for years that shows that uh, reading, whether it's memoir or, or fiction, um, increases a sense of empathy and compassion in people, and it lets you walk a mile in someone else's shoes, so to speak, um, all that kind of stuff. And I think whether it's a, a, a memoir about autism or a memoir of someone else's experience living in a different country or growing up in a certain place or with a certain uh, racial or ethnic background, whatever it is, um, coming to narrative with an open heart and an open mind to try to understand people. Because if, especially for me, if we're, if we're Christians, if we claim to follow Jesus of Nazareth, then we have to do uh, the thing that he said to do, which is love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law is kind of wrapped up in, in that. <laughs> and if you're going to love your neighbor, you have to understand your neighbor. And you might have to read some books about the kind of person your neighbor is to try to, to know what makes them tick. And so I guess that's what I would want people to take away. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, and, and I think this is, you know, a really great contribution to understanding in this direction. You know, there's you a lot so of much. books written about racism, a lot of books written about other, you know, dimensions that we all need to understand better. But, yeah. you know, this, th there aren't as many <laughs> that I know of at least, yeah. that, that are talking about the things that you're talking about in the way that you are. And yeah. I think that's incredibly valuable. Thank you. So um, without spilling any beans, I mean, are there any future books 
uh, that you can talk about it. As you said, you've written <laughs> so many different genres that, you know, I'm kind of interested in, you know, watching where you go next. <laughs> I, um, my own secret dream would be to publish the novel next. I wrote, like I said, a, a young adult novel. Uh, I really love the YA category. Um, although I mostly read literary fiction, I also read a lot of YA. And what I like about it is just the kind of um, stripped down, unapologetic coming of age story. You know, that moment when, when the uh, character moves from innocence to experience. I am still deeply fascinated by that. Um, because it usually requires some kind of suffering <laughs> and, and all of us suffer. And then what does that suffering mean? And how does it, uh, how does it shape us into who we're going to become? So I love YA stories. And uh, my counselor actually said about this book at one point, she said, you do know that when you're writing about an autistic teenager, in some ways you're looking back from your forties and you're trying to redeem or reclaim what you never had, which was the understanding. <laughs> I you know, totally that kind of thing. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I would love for that book to be out there because it could, this book will probably hit adult readers, this memoir. And I think that book could hit uh, teenagers on the spectrum who aren't, who don't feel seen or affirmed or understood. So I would love that. Uh, on a very quirky note, I have about a hundred pages of a children's book. <laughs> that's a fantasy book. And just yesterday, my son, who I, uh, had read, he's 11. I had him read the first, um, like 40 pages. He said, dad, that's the one you got to work on that book. <laughs> wow. Cool. So maybe someday I'll have, I'll have that. I don't know. I, I it's, uh, I just have a lot of interest as a writer. Well, good for you. I mean, uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, I've, I said earlier, I'm always impressed with people that can write in completely different directions like that. That's, that's... I, I, yeah, I find that for different kinds of stories, <clears throat> you know, if I see some flowers on a walk, I might want to write a poem about them because it's an image. If I have a big question and I'm and I'm picturing a, a character, it's probably going to be fiction. Picturing a character walking around and I start saying, "Where's he going? Where's he coming from? <laughs> what does he want?" And then I'm thinking that's going to be a novel. So I just have a lot of different um, uses for different genres. <laughs> so um, if people aren't familiar with your work and they want to learn more, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, we just did a refresh on my website, which I'm really happy with. It's just danielbowmanjr.com. And uh, and I, I guess also the place I'm most active really, uh, well, two places. I like to be on Twitter. And, and really the reason for that is because the writing community is largely on Twitter, uh, which has been wonderful and supportive over the years. And secondly, the autism community uh, it has been on Twitter. And I've learned so much. Really? From I didn't know that. I've made, oh, yeah, it's been great. I've made so many good friends uh, around the country and, and in the UK as well um, uh, who are autistic and who are speaking out on Twitter and expressing their experiences and things like that. So I like that. And I also like Instagram because it's a fun place to share pictures of things that I'm doing and with the family and with friends and travels, uh, once travels can resume after the pandemic, all that sort of stuff. So uh, usually my... Um, handle on any of those is just daniel bowman jr just jr at the end so i'd love to meet new people on those platforms anytime wonderful wonderful well thank you again for this great contribution of this book and yeah, also for spending some time with us today to talk about it oh thanks so much for having me this is great yeah it's really been it. wonderful to speak with you dan i wish you the best you know in this book launch and you know everything else that you're doing thank you so much i appreciate that